and welcome to Learning Music with Pat. I thought today we would take a segment and talk about the origin of sound. Where does it come from? How does it work? Why does one instrument not sound like another instrument, even though the instruments may be similar? How does that work? You know, it's like asking the question, where does sound come from? If a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, it, does it produce sound or does it not? So I can answer that question later on in the segment, but I want to start off with a story. Normally I don't ever repeat a story from one show to another. I have three shows and I, I keep them completely separate. But this story fascinated me because it has, uh, uh, it has um, a, a relevance to sound and how, it, uh, how people hear sound. It has relevance to color and how people see color. So I want to uh, just start off with this again. So there is a man and he can only see shades of gray because he is colorblind. He is a brilliant man, he's a wonderful musician, he's intelligent, he knows a lot about a lot of things, he's normal in every respect, but the only problem is, is he cannot see color. He is colorblind. Everything he sees, he sees in the shades of gray. Now, he was not happy with this, and so he undertook, uh, went along with other people, and they undertook an experiment where a chip was put in his brain and the chip is permanent and he wears a device that's almost like a band around his head. Well, it is a band around his head with an extension in front of him. When he has that band on and he's looking at color, he can hear color. Now, most of us don't even think about hearing color. You know, we see color all the time, and we don't even think that it creates a sound, but you've got to remember that color has wavelengths, and light has wavelengths, and everything that we do it, in terms of perception has wavelengths. So the color has wavelengths. We never hear it because we never wear a device that picks it up, but he has a device that picks it up. So he can look at a color. To him, it looks great because he can't see color, but that color emits wavelengths, which is picked up by that chip in this device as sound. And so therefore he can see, he can hear the sound of color, even though he can't see color. Now I find that fascinating. And uh, this device picks up the wavelengths of color and it produces tones and each color has its own wavelengths and its own tone and he can hear color in that way. Now he does a lot of painting because what he does is he will have the device on and he will see gray and he'll see the, he'll hear the tone that that color emits and he'll say, this color is red, this color is green, this color is blue. It's all gray to him because that's all he sees, but he can hear the wavelengths that the colors produce, even though we can't hear them because we don't have the device in our brain. We're not even trying to hear them to us. Sound is sound, but color is what you look at and you see the color. But with him, where he cannot see color, he can pick up the tone of the wavelengths that the colors, uh, that the colors produce. And so he can hear sound that way. So the devices help him to identify color by looking at the shades of gray and hearing tones for them. Now it doesn't give him color vision. He doesn't see color and he only see he only hears the tone of the color when he's wearing the device, but it puts him in a way interacting with a world full of color because the world is full of color. And so it, he interacts with that. Now what is the sense of him going through all of this just to pick up tones? Well, the sense is, I think, in terms of research, at some point I would like to see research progress to the point where maybe the normal ways of viewing color can be bypassed and maybe something can be 
implanted in a person's head where they actually can see color. That's done to a certain extent with vision. There are these goggle-like things that are glasses that people wear that are almost going blind, and they are going blind, and it bypasses the physiology of the eye, and so what happens is they are able to see, not a lot, but they're able to see things. They can walk down the street. They can walk around in their house. They're not bumping into things. It gives them a quality of a vision which isn't like most normal people, but they can see things. They know, they can recognize things. They can do their chores. They can, they can act as normal people because they have to wear these very heavy goggle-like things to do that. But that is the way that it is. Now, I want to get into the physics of sound, but first you have to start with vibrations. And so what I'm going to do is create some vibrations for you to listen to. And I'm going to start with a simple ruler. Yes, it can make a sound. So what I'm going to do is put the ruler on the table, and I'm just going to hit it. Do you hear the sound? And do you see the vibrations? Look at the ruler. You can see the vibrations as it's going up and down. All sound and all tone comes from the vibrations, and a plastic ruler is a good way to get started in understanding this. I also have with me a kalimba. The kalimba is called a thumb harp, and it does make vibrations. I don't know how much you're going to be able to pick up, but I'm going to hold it this way. It's a scale. Now, if I put it down on the table, I think the, the um, sound of it is going to be a lot clearer. So I went down the scale. You can go up and down the scale. Now, these you can see that these bars are not equal length. But they're all screwed in. And to get a scale, a different scale than that, all you'd have to do is unscrew it, and then you'd be able to place those in a different position so that they wouldn't be exactly like they are now. And you could get the tones so that they would be in maybe a different key. But if you see, if you can see the vibrations, I don't know as the cameras can pick that up, but as I'm looking at it, I can see the little vibrations back and forth. Now, also, I have a sound tube. I have three of these. This one is green, colorful, and I have to be careful how I do it. But if I take an... Let me try. You can hear that. If I do it faster, you can hear the beginning of a higher tone. I don't want to do it too high. Normally, I could put it on my head, but I've got, I've got microphones. <laughs> I don't want to hit the microphone. But it's definite that you are having rushing sound, and the rushing sound is causing tone. So it's a sound tool. So what is happening here? What is causing the sound? Well, I want to give you some, some definitions. An atom is the smallest building block of nature, and it has protons, and I've got this drawn down here with pluses. It has electrons. I have this down here with, uh, with little minus signs, and it has neutrons. They have no charge at all. So you have atom, the atom is being the smallest uh, building block that nature has. Now, the atoms will join together to form molecules, and the molecules are groups of atoms put together. There's no specific size to the molecules. The molecules can be uh, small with just a few groups of atoms, or they can be large, very large. And you no, know, it's so tiny that if you have, uh, if you have an atom 
and, and it's bouncing around with an electron. It's so tiny that it's like it would be the equivalent of miles between them, even though that it's very tiny and that the whole thing is tiny. But if you were to be able to, to get a perspective on the distances between the electrons, the protons, the neutrons, and so forth, there would be a great space between them. So you have these molecules, and they're all together, they're, and, uh, and they will, are very important in the transmission of sound because if you did not have the molecules, you would not have sound. So you have sound waves. And what sound waves are, are bundled up molecules. So you start off with the atoms, then you get the atoms joining together to form molecules. And when you get a whole group of molecules that are, uh, that are bound up together and bundled up together, you're going to start to get your sound waves. So sound is always going to start with a vibration and the vibration causes the air to move and the molecules are bound up together and they form sound waves. It's kind of a simplified explanation but that basically is what is happening. Vibrations compress molecules and push them in different directions, up, down, sideways, forward. And these molecules compress other molecules. So what you're getting is starting with a vibration, the atoms are bundled up into molecules, the molecules are pushing each other and compressing each other, and, make, and they don't make noise, but they transpose, they, they cause the noise to go forward. In other words, they push and compress other molecules and they transfer sound. They do not make sound. Molecules do not make sound, but they compress sound. And the molecules push each other and they, uh, the molecules uh, uh, transfer the sound. They do not make sound, as I mentioned that before. So without molecules, there is no sound. You have to start off with a molecule to begin with. Whoops. And I mentioned this before. If you hear a sonic boom, if you hear uh, a loud clap of thunder, you can almost feel it on your skin, and you can hear it, but you sometimes feel it on your skin. But the eardrum gets most of the sound. We draw sound as sound waves, and the larger the waves, the deeper the sound. And I'm going to show this to you just as I've drawn it out here. Loud sounds have a bigger amplitude in the waves. Softer sounds have a smaller amplitude in the waves. The sound does not last long. If you hit a piano key, press a piano key, it's not going to last very long. The sound, you hit the sound, and then it kind of fades out. Because the way that the molecules and the waves work, it becomes disorganized with time, and then the sound fades. But I have to say that's not completely true of a digitized sound. If you have a digital piano, you can press that sound, you can press that key, and the sound goes and goes and goes and goes until you finally lift up on it. But most of the uh, instruments that we have up in until the present time were all acoustics. You flip, uh, you, you uh, hit a string, you press down a piano key, and then suddenly, you know, it just fades away and it's gone. But with other instruments that are electronic and digitized, that doesn't happen. But it's natural for the wave to go so long and then disorganize and pull apart from each other. The wave kind of fades and then the sound is gone. That's the way it usually works. So uh, that's ha the, the sound will stop. Now, I was at a concert at a university that I was connected with, and this concert, they had a brand new piano. It was a concert grand piano. It was huge. They had a huge stage. We had several sound stages and special music buildings, and this piano went right all across the stage. They had the ma main area where you play it, but the back of it where the strings are just went for feet and feet and feet. It was tremendously expensive in the 
thousands of dollars. Well, it was a brand new piano, and they had an artist coming in, a pianist coming in to play it. They didn't stop to check it. What could possibly go wrong with a brand new piano, a concert grand piano? There was one of the strings that would stick, and it wouldn't unstick. And as long as it was stuck, that tone that the pianist would hit kept on going and going and going, and it didn't fade out. It was like it was constantly being hit. But the, the pianist would hit the, hit the key and then go on to something else. That tone is ringing out. Well, you can't have that. It would destroy the, the pianist's concert. So what a person had to do, one of the music department members, who was also a pianist, got up and stood by the piano, his back to the audience, because if you can imagine a grand piano, you have to lift up the cover to get full sound. So he can't, from the backside, stop the string from vibrating. So he had to stand back to the audience, just stand there, and every time that note was hit, he had to go in and pluck it and see if he could stop it from ringing. Now, when you get a complicated piece of music and there's a lot of scale work, that's going to be a very, that uh, tone is going to be plucked very, very frequently. And so he's there plucking and plucking and plucking. It's not perfect, but it's better than if he hadn't been there. So that's a brand new piano. I, I think you have to check everything you get to make sure it works right. right. But normally a wave will be disorganized in, in an acoustic instrument and the sound will stop. Now, if the sound lasted too long, it would sound like chaos. You know, it just wouldn't be clear. It wouldn't sound good. Now, what about our way of hearing? What about our ears and our eardrums? Um, our eardrums will vibrate, and then they push against the bones in the ear, and hair in the ear connects to the nerves, and then the sound goes to the brain to be interpreted. It's like a process. Do you know when you see something, you really see it upside down. By the time it gets to the optic nerve, what the image that you've seen is upside down. It goes from the octave ner optic nerve to the brain, and then the brain reverses it, gets it standing right side up, and then interprets what it is. And that's how you see. It's a much more complicated process than you might think. But the eardrum vibrates, and, it, and uh, the ear becomes like a sounding board. It pushes against the bones. Here in the ear is connected, uh, and the sound goes to the brain to be interpreted. What about vocal cords? Vocal cords act like a reed in an instrument because they vibrate. If you're singing, your vocal cords are vibrating. Air from the lungs push past the cords and cause them to vibrate. And now men's and women's vocal cords are different. Men's vocal cords are thick and they vibrate more slowly and so therefore they have a deeper tone. The men's voices are deeper than women's. For women's vocal cords, they're thinner, they vibrate faster, and they have a higher pitch tone. Children's vocal cords um, are quite a bit thinner because they're not developed yet, and the sinus cavities are also not developed, so therefore that's not complete. The tone then is going to be even thinner, and the sinus cavities are going to act like a sound box. So children cannot sound like adults, they just can't, although I have heard some children sing who are really gifted. They sound more adult-like, but their sinus cavities just are not completely developed, and so the, the sound box effect is a little different in children than it is in adults. What about singing? The pitch is controlled by muscle tension of the vocal cords. The quality is determined by the size and shape of the mouth, the throat, and the tongue. And each person has vocal cords, sinus spaces, the mouth itself, the shape of the mouth itself, the tongue, the teeth, and they all affect the sound. No two people sound alike when they sing. And it's all due to the physical nature of the human body. 
vocal sounds are made by moving the tongue and it changes the shape of your mouth as you talk. You're changing the shape of your mouth by the way that you move your tongue. The characteristics of sound are intensity, pitch, and quality. Now the pitch, whether it's high or low, whatever kind of pitch it is, comes from the frequency or the speed of sound that is sent out by the vibrating source, which is going to be the vocal cords. You vibrate, the vocal cords vibrate. That gets everything started. And then the sound comes from there. There is a process that is involved with that. Uh, humans can hear sound as low as 20 vibrations a second. Humans can hear sound as high as 16,000 vibrations a second. Resonance, I want to mention that. If you pluck a string on a guitar, another string may sound even though it has not been plucked because one is resonating with the other. If a violin string is, a, is vibrating and giving sound, another violin string will start vibrating at the same frequency and give the same sound because one is vibrating the other. I have to watch my time here. But I think we'll have time to finish this, or what the most important parts of it. Tuning notes. If two notes are not exactly pitched, supposing I'm playing a flute and I'm trying to tune another student's flute, we will be playing the same note. If you hear a little kind of a accent, like on the notes when they're not exactly the same, like a pulsating beat, then you know you're not exactly in pitch. Overtones are a note, it sounds like a note that's squealed, and students do it all the time, adults do too, um, because the tones, uh, holes are not exactly covered. So it, it's an overtone. An overtone is a real tone. It sounds like a squeal. If you don't get the tone just right, it actually, you're doing another tone that's much higher. Sounds like a squeal, but it really is a tone in, its, in, in and of itself. Whoops. Overtones, if two notes have the same pitch, but they're differing a little in their quality due to the overtones. Here's a tone, here's a tone, and then you get an overtone between them. A lot of times if I'm playing with somebody, they're playing all right, I'm playing all right, but you hear a little squiggly tone that none of us are playing, that is a type of overtone. It can be quite annoying if it doesn't fit with the, with the sounds that you're playing. So why do instruments sound differently? Well, the saxophones don't sound like trumpets, violins do not sound like flutes, but they do sound uh, differently, and it has to do with the quality of the sound. It depends on wood, it, the sound depends on wood, metal, plastic, hard rubber, glass, pyrex, any material will make a different kind of vibration and will make a different kind of so sound. I want, I'm about uh, out of time, but if you uh, talk about the Stradivarius violins, they sound so differently and they're so uh, expensive. Well, they came from a, a forest, uh, the wood came from a forest that was very, very, very cold. There was a few years when that forest was very cold, and it changed the nature of the wood. So when they made the violins from that wood, the quality of the sound was richer, deeper, nicer, and that's where they get their value. Well, we're about out of time, so I won't be able to continue and answer the question of why does, if a tree falls in the woods, does it make a sound if nobody is there to hear it? It depends upon your definition of sound. If your definition of sound is that uh, someone has to hear it, then it doesn't make a sound if no one's there. If your definition of sound is it doesn't matter, all it has to have is its vibrations to be considered sound, then it does make a sound. Not a complete explanation, but I don't have time to do anything else. We are out of time. So we'll close it here. Please join me next time. We'll be dealing with musical questions that I often get asked.